For those of you who aren't too sure who I am, my name's Robert Metz. I'm the president of the Freedom Party of Ontario. I'm one of the founding members. Um, just a few quick announcements before I get underway. You might have noticed already that our latest Freedom Flyer is out, the latest issue of our party newsletter, Freedom Flyer, our first uh, election issue. It's already gone out in the mail. It went out a couple days ago. So uh, most of you here are going to be getting it in the mail, even if you, but if you want to pick up a couple of extra copies, please be, you know, feel free to do so. <laughs> we also have at the table here membership forms that you can sign. Memberships are $10 each if you haven't done so already. And uh, our first batch of membership cards since our new reconstitution just went out last week as well. Um, for those of you living in the London area who get Rogers Cable, just so that you know, this upcoming Tuesday evening on Rogers Cable, uh, sometime between 9 and 10 o'clock on the Jim Chapman Live Show, will be featured our party leader, Paul McKeever, for a second appearance on that show locally. And for those of you who are candidates in the audience today, uh, particularly those of you from the uh, Toronto area or around, I want you to know that we're having our next Toronto area candidate workshop on May 3rd, and we'll be getting in touch with you about that um, very shortly. Uh, certainly after the dinner and before that period of time. Now when our mailer for this dinner first went out, it was two days before the war in Iraq had begun. Now, three weeks later, Baghdad is in American hands, it seems, and the war has entered its second stage of action. These events have had, and will continue to have, a profound effect on politics and economics here at home in Canada and in Ontario. There was much speculation that Ernie Eves would call the Ontario election during the war, since it might provide him with a terrific distraction. But as he no, so, no doubt soon discovered, I think the war has been too great a distraction, and few are thinking about pro uh, provincial politics at this particular date. Add to that some of the issues around Ernie Eves' own lack of stance on issues, and you can see why the election may well be put off much later. There was every possibility at the time our dinner mailer went out that we could have been in an, right in the middle of an election period today. But current speculation holds that we will now most likely be facing a fall election. And if that is true, we now have an unprecedented opportunity before us. In the few brief moments that I have to speak, I want to make clear why I think this is so. Because instead of having to do everything within this short 28-day election period, we now have time on our side, while the other parties really have time working against them. For example, number one, we already have more candidates registered now uh, for the next provincial election than we've ever had before. Given our current progress, I see no reason why we should not have enough candidates to, form, to be able to form a majority government in this upcoming uh, provincial election. You've all got a copy of the green sheet on your, on your tables there, which is also in your newsletter that's being mailed out. But you'll see 27 of our candidates who are already registered, paperwork done and everything. We're working on another uh, 12 to 20 candidates on top of those who are going to be in the process of registering. And curiously enough, there's a handful of candidates who told us they couldn't run in this spring, but could, ru could run if the election was held in the fall, so we may be able to add them back on board as well. Um, just to give you an idea of where we are already registered, this is a partial map of, of the Ontario map of riding. Is that right side up? No, it's not. Well, so this is just the southern part of the province. But the divisions here all represent the various ridings. What has been highlighted in yellow is where we are already registered. But I'm not quite up to date because we've already got Nipissing in, and we're picking up some ridings now in Ottawa and in the Mississauga areas that are filled in. As you can see, southern Ontario is pretty well filled in now, and the area around Kitchener and upward into this area still has to be filled in. But a lot of them are in the process of doing so. So. Uh, we live in a large province, and there's 103 ridings in this province, and we need 52 candidates to be able to form a majority government uh, and to be able to go to the electorate with that many candidates so that they can have trust in the government that can be, become a majority government. We're pretty well already in a situation where we could form a minority government if our candidates won. So 
all this is, of course, extremely promising. You may have already noticed our election signs are in production. Don't they look a little different from what we've been used to in the past? Um, as you might have guessed, we are making a direct attack into Tory territory because we think we want to claim the true right. And so I think that when the voters start seeing these signs popping out in their ridings and mixed in with the rest, that's going to be a story in and of itself. To say nothing of our provincial campaign that's coming up. And they're already in production. Some of the candidates already have their signs all ready to go. Our fundraising efforts have been and continue to be ongoing. This is our second election dinner. In every election past, we were lucky if we got one dinner in within that 28-day period of the election. And we may yet get another election dinner or two in before the writ is dropped this fall, or heaven forbid, next spring. We've been holding candidate workshops all around the province, including places like Belleville, Sarnia, Toronto, Lindsay, and there are two upcoming workshops for London, with a date yet to be determined, and for Toronto, which as I said earlier is on May 3rd. For the first time, our candidates are being made aware of our plans and our strategy, being able to see the big picture at the provincial level to the fine details of how to run an effective campaign at the riding level. We've been systematically targeting energy industry leaders, independent educa education advocates, and key members of the media with mailings focused on their single issue of interest. And this is something we've been doing on the side now for about, uh, you know, behind the scenes for about eight months now. We have a provincial strategy that will widely promote and introduce both Freedom Party and our party leader to Ontarians throughout all of Ontario's major newspapers for the first time. We will be distributing a minimum of a quarter million tab-sized newspaper pieces that will be inserted into the Globe and Mail, Toronto Star, uh, the National Post, London Free Press, the Ottawa Citizen, Sarnia Daily News, all, all of them will get copies of this targeted to those areas where we know that the voter turnout is the highest. We have a current executive who are each contributing fully by following through on their delegated tasks and assignments and offering the support that is so necessary and that our candidates so, so, so much need to have that central backup with a provincial party. We basically have all the infrastructure in place now. And of course, last but not least, we have a party leader whose dedication, passion, and intense support for Freedom Party is what has been the source of most of the progress you've seen us make so far to this date. I first met Paul McKeever probably about 10 or 12 years ago when he used to come up and, and uh, visit our office when we were headquartered still in downtown London at King and Richmond Street, which where we no longer are at. We're on Commissioner's Road, not too far from here right now. And at that time, Paul was still going to a university where he was picking up one of his, what do you got now, three or four uh, degrees? No, I can't keep track. <laughs> three, I think. Yeah. And uh, Paul, of course, is a, is a lawyer practicing, not in London, although the article here and went to UWO here. He's, uh, his, his office is in the riding that you're going to be running in, is that correct? It's That's Oshawa. Correct. And, um, you know, during our conversations about the election, kind of issues we, we run into. There's one that keeps coming up, an issue that's an undercurrent under all of the other issues. It's just fundamental to everything that we want to do, even though we are focusing on the major three issues of uh, health care, education, and electricity. The issue that Paul wants to talk to you about tonight is the one that keeps resurfacing over and over again. And I think it's something that we should all bear in mind. So with that in mind, I'd like to introduce for you tonight our party leader, Mr. Paul McKeever. Paul. Ladies and gentlemen, in recent days, a socialist dictator has been removed from power. Some have actually struggled to see the justification for it. Ontario's Premier has purported to deliver a budget outside the legislature in an auto parts factory. The Premier himself struggles to find his justification for that. <laughs> you can only conclude that it was not a very popular thing to do. Accordingly, it's incumbent upon us to revisit the definition of a word both overused and poorly defined. A word that by virtue of its reputation as a reference to all that is good in society enshrouds even the most immoral forms of government with a veil of respectability. 
a word that in so many societies arouses such warm and passionate emotions that virtually any government action done in its name rarely need fear any scrutiny. A word that has become so well respected that an explicit understanding of its meaning seems unimportant to most, and that a widespread understanding of its meaning is undesirable to a scheming view. And speaking, of course, of the word democracy. The word is Greek, but translated literally means people power, or rule by people. Since the word was first used, but perhaps most frequently in the past century or two, the natural question asked by those who study government and society is, how do people rule in a, in a democracy? How? There have been many answers. Marxists, holding that the decisions of the collective are more important than the desires of the individual, have argued that in a true democracy, the machinery of production, capital, should be owned by people collectively. According to the Marxists, the majority of people then decide how to use the capital for the benefit of the collective. This model of government they call social democracy. Some individualists, holding the peaceful decisions of the individual to be more important than the desires of a collective, have rejected democracy outright, on the ground that its you know, majority rule is illogically inconsistent with individual freedom. While other individualists have nonetheless embraced democracy, but have instead argued that in a real democracy, there are limits on the power of the majority. Those limits are typically cited to be individual rights or freedoms. And in some cases, the limits are said to relate to an individual's rights of life, liberty, and property. We typically find these advocates of individual freedom and democracy championing, championing uh, court-enforced bills of rights as limits on the lawmaking powers uh, of the majority in the legislatures. And such people often call this form of democracy a liberal democracy. Yet other people have argued for direct democracy. Here we see a different sort of pro-democrat. The advocate of a system in which the will of the majority should not be and is not stymied by individual freedoms or rights, and in which the power of the legislature is held to be supreme to that of a bill of rights enforced by an unelected judiciary. The advocate of direct democracy is philosophically attached neither to the supremacy of the collective will, nor to the supremacy of individual freedom. Whether because they believe in the inherentness, inherent inherentness of mankind, or whether because they see majority rule as the only means to override constitutional limitations on the protections of uh, individual freedom matters not. The simple fact is that whatever values such people may hold to claim, or claim to hold, sorry, whether an attachment to freedom of speech, or property rights, or racial tolerance, etc., all such values are secondary to their commitment to unmitigated majority rule. Social democracy, liberal democracy, direct democracy. It's been my observation that few meaningful words depend for their understanding upon an adjective. And yet that is precisely the situation with the definitions commonly given to the word democracy. In the minds of the Marxists, the populists, and even some individualists, the word democracy ceases to confer any meaning at all, except perhaps that, in one way or another, the majority of people should rule. But even that meager definition cannot survive careful scrutiny. In Canada, for example, but also in numerous democracies of ancient Greece, not all of the governed voted. In virtually all democracies, only a small subset of people, chosen by lot or by election, have voted on laws. The majority of people cannot be said to rule in that sense. Enter another adjective in a desperate attempt to save the notion that democracy means majority rule. Representative democracy. As it turns out, that adjective fails miserably to solve the problem. In many countries, even the selection of representatives is not dependent upon majority opinion. In Canada, for example, one need only have the support of the largest minority of voters in order to win a seat in the legislature. Yet Canada and other multi-party jurisdictions with our first-past-the-post system consider themselves democracies. I submit to you that by oversight or by design, those who bother to think about or discuss democracy <coughs> have the gun. By assuming that democracy is a society that makes its rules in a certain way, by assuming that democracy is a lawmaking process, the semantic guardians of democracy have ensured that virtually any society in which political opinion is voiced or a representative chosen by at least some of the governed, 
can claim to be a democracy. I submit to you that if democracy is to have a value beyond the usefulness, uh, beyond its usefulness to corrupt government sloganeers bent on justifying the unjustifiable, we must ask the primary and more basic question. Before we ask how people rule in a democracy, we must ask what is meant by the word demo, people. When we turn our mind to this question and to its answers, a multitude of implications appear. Specifically, if, the word people, if by the word people we infer the collective, we are led mindlessly and quickly to the question that all Marxists, individualists, populists, are eager to answer in their own wildly differing ways. How does a collective express its will, or how do people govern? But if, when we attempt to define the word people, we do not carelessly forget that every individual has the same inalienable natural rights, and that all individuals are equal in that sense, democracy takes on a whole new, logical, and grander meaning. To those who recognize in every individual the same inalienable rights of life, liberty, and property, people means individuals, all of whom have the same natural rights. Thus, to logical advocates of individual freedom, democracy means ruled by individuals having the same natural rights as everyone else. We commonly hear that equality is a value treasured in a democracy. I submit that it is not merely a value in a democracy, but that equality, the sameness of every person's rights, is the defining feature of democracy. In any society that recognizes all individuals to have only certain rights, rule by people necessarily implies rule by equals. The significance of this is, of course, tremendous. When the rights of our governors are the same as the rights of the governed, governors, even when they act in concert and call themselves the government, can take no action that cannot morally be taken by one of the governed. The governed, lacking the right to violate another person's uh, liberty, cannot have their liberty violated even by individuals in government. The governed, lacking the right to take another's property against their will, cannot have their property taken from them against their will, even by individuals in government. Whereas governed individuals may not morally initiate the coercive use of physical force against others, they do have the immoral authority to use force in defense of their life, liberty, and their property. Thus, in a society that recognizes individual rights, democracy can mean only a society in which the government lacks the, the authority to violate any individual's rights of life, liberty, and property but is charged with the responsibility of protecting those rights for every individual. Now, of course, the advocate of Marxism would say, aye, McKeever, but individuals don't have rights. But that defense only points to the logical flaw underlying the Marxist claim to democracy. It could hardly be denied that a government is a thing with the right to use force. However, in a Marxist society, the individual has no rights. It follows that in a Marxist society, the term democracy would refer to a society ruled by people having no rights. At this point, you must ask yourself, how can people lacking rights logically have the right to rule? The answer, of course, is they cannot. Denying that individuals have individual rights, a truly Marxist society can have a government only if the government is comprised of individuals having rights that the governed lack. In other words, Marxism though completely compatible with voting, and though completely uh, capable of having a ruler, is logically and utterly opposed to a government comprised of the people. It is an enemy of democracy, and I might add, of equality. The advocate of so-called direct democracy might also chime in. Some advocates of direct democracy, you might say, agree that individuals have rights. But whether we agree that those rights exist Advances in technology now make it possible to determine the will of the majority of all voters. Therefore, democracy does logically mean majority rule. But the argument of the direct democrat is no more impressive than that of the Marxist. If a direct democrat has choose the notion that individuals have inalienable rights, he shares the aforementioned logical flaw of the Marxists. He cannot advocate democracy because individuals who lack rights outside of government also lack rights when they get together in government. And if the direct democrat embraces the existence of inalienable rights, he renders majority rule inoperable. Because the majority, for the majority's will to prevail, logic dictates that no individual can have a right which would limit or negate the will of the majority. 
seemingly ignorant of hard -earned reward, the hard-earned rewards of the glorious revolution of 1688, part of the history of North American government, the direct Democrat in reality is an absolutist whose Sun King is not an individual, but a, a dynamically constituted subgroup of the governed. The direct Democrat, like the Social Democrat, in fact, tests democracy. He wants to overcome the rights of the individuals with the crushing force of the will of the majority. An enemy of democracy, he actually favors a fluid sort of oligarchy, or aristocracy. How, in a nutshell, should we comprehend democracy? I submit that to know what democracy is, we must first remember what it is not. Remember that democracy is neither the process by which a, government's, or by which a society's laws are made, nor a society whose laws are made in a certain way. Remember that only a society with a government whose authority uh, to use force is the same as that held by the governed may rightly be called a democracy. Who then is in favor of democracy? Perhaps it is easier to tell who is not. Look for the politician who is willing to do virtually anything that is popular, without regard to every individual's rights of life, liberty, and property. Look for the politician whose opinion changes with, and is governed almost entirely by, public opinion polls. Look for the politician who implicitly declares that he is the state by shielding his decisions from the scrutiny and opposition of Parliament. Though he will praise democracy, he is in his heart an absolutist sun king who holds democracy in contempt. Who defends democracy? Those who recognize that the actions of individuals acting in concert as a government are subject to the same moral judgments as the actions of those individuals acting alone. Those who believe that every individual in the peaceful pursuit of personal fulfillment has absolute rights to his or her or their uh, life, liberty, and property. Among them are the people in this room, supporters of Freedom Party. And what of elections? They are an indispensable safeguard for freedom, but elections do not a democracy make. So in the upcoming elections, vote for freedom, and democracy will necessarily be the result. Thank you. To, to bring this, the issue you just brought up, Paul, even closer to home in terms of what's happening today, interesting, yesterday I was watching on CNN the uh, editor of Newsweek International, his name is Fareed Zakhara, and he was talking about the crisis that's about to loom in Iraq. Now that the, uh, the military part of the war is over, they have to institute democracy. And he said most of the people there do not understand the process and how it can be done successfully in the right order. And he said the first thing you have to have is the rule of law. Then you have capitalism. Then you introduce democracy. Because unless it happens in that order, if you introduce democracy first, you will have, as he put it, a wild orgy of nationalism. Now, to bring it closer to home, and it's in our current Freedom Flyer, you'll notice that on the back page, London West, are the four candidates, two of the candidates along with Bill Frampton. And it's interesting to hear what they say about democracy, particularly the NDP and the Conservatives. The NDP platform, for example, they want to repair democracy. In fact, they, their catchphrase is public power in which supporters look to restore power to the people by encouraging voter turnout and participation in public issues among the populace. Now what do you suppose Bob Wood wants to do? He's from the PCs. Let's see how different he sounds. Well, he wishes to, quote, democratize the legislative process even more. They're already voting there. How do you democratize it even more? He has seen his constituency increase, and he wants to restore many of the programs that we've had before and therefore you do that by reinstituting more democracy. So there's a couple of examples of how really what the other parties are trying to offer us as a product is something that they call democracy, but which is in fact, as Paul pointed out, something very different. And it's something we run into all the time, this tremendous misunderstanding of what the word democracy is. But now to move on to the second part of our program and that's to introduce you to some of the candidates that are here this evening. Um, each of them are going to be speaking for you, the ones that are here this evening, uh, for no more than two minutes apiece. And um, because then we can get them all in within about half an hour. And then we'll be done and wrapped up. But the first candidate that I want to introduce to you 
is our candidate for London West, and that's Bill Frampton, who's sitting here. Um, Bill is much more than our candidate for London West. He has been the party's vice president for many years now, and he has been a past candidate in both Mississauga and in the Ottawa areas when he, when he lived there at those times. Bill manages Freedom Party's online bookstore, which is on our website. He, and even though he has a full-time day job, you'll find him on many evenings working in Freedom Party's offices, recruiting either members or candidates. He's the guy that has recruited most of our candidates to date. And thanks to Bill, we will have the candidates necessary to do the job that is ahead of us. And he'll be taking over from here on in this evening, uh, hosting responsibilities. After giving you his own two-minute introduction or less address to you, Bill will be introducing some of our other candidates who are here this evening, and each will have about two minutes to introduce themselves to you and to convey their personal messages outside, of course, the scope of party policy. We don't want them all here telling you the same thing over and over again, uh, so they're going to talk a little bit more about themselves. So, Bill, uh, you're first up, and I'll be timing you for two minutes. Okay? <laughs> Bill Frank. Thanks very much, Bob. It's, uh, it's very kind words. It's a great pleasure to be here tonight and see so many people here supporting our efforts as we get ready for the next election. Both uh, faces new and old. Some of you know me from before, some of you don't. As Bob mentioned, I'm currently the Vice President. I've been for a few years. I've been around this party for over 15 years now. I've been a past candidate, organizer, supporter, speaker. That's been a lot of fun. And I think having heard our leader, Paul McKeever, tonight give an address, which uh, personally I was, as always, very impressed with, I hope you'll all agree that we're going places. We have a team. We're building a team. We're going to have a great campaign. I'm looking forward to it immensely. Now, a, a little bit about my own background. Uh, as Bob mentioned, I've uh, been involved in the party in a number of different areas of the province. I'm a computer uh, program around this by profession. People in that line of work move around a bit. And so it just happened that wherever I happened to be at the time, that's where my involvement was uh, based. Now I'm back here in London, which allows me to be a lot more active here at headquarters and we can get more things organized. We have that infrastructure in place now that Bob alluded to. And as a result, I'm convinced we're going to have a great campaign. I'm looking forward to it immensely. Although I am personally glad to have a few months more to organize further and recruit more candidates <laughs> and make it even bigger and better than we figured it was going to be. Even if it, even if it was on now, it would be a campaign that would get people taking notice of us. So I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be a blast. And at this time, I'd like to ask our candidate for uh, Perth, Middlesex, Rob Snake, to come up and say a few words. Oh. Rob Snake, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> okay, well, um, uh, very happy to see everybody here tonight, and thanks for coming out. And uh, if you have any friends that uh, you think might be interested in... Uh, and running, we have some empty uh, ridings out there that need to be filled. Um, I've run in every provincial election since I think '84. Um, my experience—I uh, I don't really have a prepared speech, but I just want to tell uh, anybody that is in the party: if you if you ever um, um, confronted with an issue and you don't, you know, you're not quite sure how to attack it or how to give a proper Freedom Party response. You, you can pretty well be guaranteed that you're on the right track if you look at one of two issues. I, either follow the money, okay, because every political issue, no matter what or how it's described or how it's, you know, um, covered, uh, dressed up or whatever, it's always about the money, okay? And the second thing is uh, who has the choice, the freedom of choice, on the issue. If you, if you look at who the choice makers are on any issue, you pretty well get to the bottom of it. So, I've always used, used those two um, posts as a kind of checking point to 
you know, concern or break down or build up any issue that uh, you want to uh, address. So I just thought I'd maybe help you by telling you uh, that little bit of information. Hope it helps. Thanks a lot. Thanks very much, Rob. It's a good insight for people to have. At this time, I'd like to ask our, 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 one of our newer candidates, who's going to be running up in Algoma, Manitoulin, Gordon Mood, to come up. Yes, this is the first time I've run, so I don't exactly uh, know what to say, except uh, I uh, became involved with the Freedom Party in, I guess, 1984, uh, which was, I think, the founding year, was it not? And uh, I'd actually seen Bob in 1979. Uh, as a libertarian candidate at, uh, at my high school. And uh, Bob was uh, debating uh, several issues. I, I think they were probably the same issues that we're debating now. And uh, <laughs> he, he was the only candidate that actually seemed to make a lot of sense, uh, even though at that time I had no idea what a libertarian candidate was or what the philosophy was. Uh, it seemed to make a lot of sense. So a few years later, I saw an article in the London Free Press about Bob and Mark forming the Freedom Party. And so I went down to City Lights Bookshop, and I uh, spoke to Mark Emery. And he said, oh, well, you want to know about the Freedom Party? Here, read these two books, Capitalism, the Unknown Ideal, and Atlas Shrugged. And uh, that'll get you where you want to be. And so I uh, read those books and uh, became impressed with the ideas in that. And, uh, started working for the Freedom Party uh, uh, and Bob up in the office, uh, phoning various people, and one of the persons that uh, I called was actually Carol. <laughs> and, uh, you paid for that one, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> I was uh, calling her dad to uh, try and fundraise some money for the Freedom Party, and so I contacted her, and then a few days later, I met her at City Lights Bookshop, and uh, we were married shortly after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I've taken the step now to run in Algoma, and uh, the reason I'm running in Algoma is because my mother's from that area, and we have uh, family up there, and, uh, so, and we know people up there who can help us in our campaign. So we're hoping that we'll grab the, uh, the coldest seat that I think is uh, <laughs> in, in the house, uh, at least one of them. I think there's maybe two other cold seats up there. But uh, uh, we'll hope for the best in all gold. Thank you. Thanks very much, Gordon. At this time, I'd like to call upon uh, someone who ran for us in the last election and is running again in Toronto in the riding of Don Valley East, Wayne Simmons. Hey. Thank you very much. Um, I think this uh, election is going to show, uh, give us an opportunity to really um, bring our message forward. Um, I think that. Uh, what uh, Paul has done uh, for this party is uh, really good. I think that uh, we're going to make a presence known uh, across Ontario, and especially with the uh, advertising uh, uh, nifty idea, I think will resonate with a lot of uh, younger people as well. Um, my interest in, free in the Freedom Party came about when I read uh, um, The New Left, The Anti-Industrial Revolution, and it was one of Ayn Rand's books. And, uh, I was uh, I read mainly her nonfiction and also capitalism and a non ideal. Many of, uh, of the party are uh, more philosophical, and uh, I think that if you sell, if you can get people to read uh, some of the ideas in these books, I think that uh, uh, all a lot of the issues uh, will come together, uh, and I think that that's very very important. Um, I really enjoyed running the last provincial election. And I think that if anyone is interested in um, selling their ideas and, and convincing others, uh, this gives you a really good opportunity to uh, 
to bring forward uh, your ideas in the community, and you'll find a lot of people will walk up to you on the street and go, yeah, you were the one that was running the last election. You were the one that uh, 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 brought forward these radical ideas. And you'll notice that a lot of the uh, uh, parties will not um, uh, be bringing forward a lot of new, fresh ideas. And you'll be able to swing a lot of the conversation at your all-candidates debates to what you actually believe. Uh, because you stand for something. Uh, and unlike maybe, and although there are parties like the, uh, the communists uh, who stand for something, you can at least say, well, at least I don't advocate the slaughtering of individuals. <laughs> so uh, so um, it's, this is an opportunity for you to, uh, to win Friends for Liberty, and uh, I really am looking forward to this election. And uh, um, let's all get out there and win people for liberty. Thank you. We have uh, more candidates in Toronto and the area already lined up than we've had in the past. And it is, in fact, within the realm of possibility, with the t extra time we have to organize, that we might be able to cover all of Toronto, at least that's one of my objectives, in recruiting candidates. And at this time, I'd like to call upon one of our newer candidates, who is also in the Toronto area, in the riding of uh, Parkdale High Park, and that's Dick Field. Speechless. <laughs> I, I found Paul's uh, discussion of democracy very, very interesting. Uh, I was, uh, I formed about 1993 a, an organization called the Voice of Canadians Committees. I was very concerned about the loss of freedoms across Canada. Everywhere we went, we were losing, and we're still losing. So I'm interested in personal, individual freedom, civil rights. A lot of what Paul talked about, I discussed many, many times in the past and came to the conclusion that the easiest way that you can put that message across to people, if you like, is to take the foundations of the British common law type of democracy that found its way down through the parliamentary system and down through this Constitution of the United States of America. And I don't know if you realize it, but the revolutionaries in the United States of America fought for those freedoms, and that's why they had the revolution. They had the revolution because they felt their rights as Englishmen were being trampled upon. And that, those were their first messages to the parliament in England. We are not revolting because we do not respect and we do not understand the Parliament of England and the King of England. We are revolting because we demand our rights for constitutional representation here in North America. Our rights are being trampled upon. I think myself, if, if, if we continue the way we are, in uh, Canada. Canada's finished. Every right we ever had is being trampled on. Free speech. Under the Human Rights Code, you cannot any longer publish or say anything that targets a member of a designated group and causes them mental anguish. That is, you hurt their feelings. Look, under our system of, of democracy, you have the right to say anything you wish to say. Now, you may get a punch in the nose if you're rude, <laughs> but you have that right. And nobody can stop you from saying what you want to say. We live under the same set of laws as the king and the same set of laws if we're a pauper. And that's what we said, and that's what we mean. And that's what we stand for. And that's what I went overseas to fight for. And some of you in this probably did the same thing. I didn't go over there to fight for our social programs. <laughs> I went over there to fight for our right to say what the hell we think. <laughs> I'm 
ashamed of many of the people that today call themselves Canadians. I think when we come back to the Freedom Party uh, here, they're one of the first parties in a long, long time that has begin, begun to incorporate within themselves some of those basic fundamental principle, principles, equality before the law, and not just the law, but the same laws as everybody else. And what we've got is a series of laws for people of different skin color, different sexual orientations, and so on. You can't do it, folks, because you create constituencies that will fight with one another for benefits and create civil unrest, and it will increase as, as time goes on. I feel that within Ontario here, we have a marvelous opportunity to fight for a lot of this stuff to get it back in place and get the students to understand it, the young people when they're growing up, what they have to fight for. You know, the right for trial by jury. You don't have it anymore unless you have, they're going to be sentenced to prison for five years or more. Uh, the right of habeas corpus, who cannot be held in prison without charge within a reasonable amount of time. We don't always have that anymore. You have the right to be treated the same as everybody else before and under the law, and certainly we don't have that anymore. You don't have property rights in your constitution anymore, and that has to come back, and so on. Now, what's important, I'm going over the two minutes, but what's important here is that, is that we are in Ontario the largest, most productive province in Canada. We're not making use of it. Because being the largest province, being the most populous province, being the most productive province, being the most uh, urbanized and industrial province, we have clout and we've got to use it. And that's why I would like to see us get in government so that we can wring the neck of the chicken that's sitting up there in Ottawa. Hey. Thank you for that, uh, Carol. Yes, 
be very interesting. We have a, a candidate with us tonight whose campaign in some ways has already begun. He's already been getting great press and even uh, been a target of the press. He's run for us once before. He's in the riding of Halliburton, Victoria Brock. Please welcome Charles Lido. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. It is nice to see you here tonight. First of all, I will mention something about myself. I first started off in politics by running in the party already for the PCs under the late Larry Grossman. Since then, I have run for the Confederation of Regions. I helped form the Canada Party. I ran for the Canadian Action Party. And now, in the last uh, provincial election, I ran for the Freedom Party, and I've uh, found a home here in the Freedom Party. And if you think I've, I've been a has-been because I ran, I ran, I ran, I am certainly not a has-been, because with the help of the people in the Freedom Party, I am hoping to have a new job at the next election, and that is going to be the MP. <laughs> I'd just like to mention this morning I had a wrong phone call, a wrong number phone call, and it happened to be a friend of mine. <laughs> um, he said, is that you, Charlie? I said, yes, that's me. He says, listen, he says, you come on down and talk to me, he says, when I'm milking my cows, and he says, I'll help you in your campaign. That gentleman has snubbed his nose at the Milk Marketing, milk marketing Board of Canada and has set up his own milk they're producing on the market in the States. So I had that, and then this morning, I picked up the newspaper this morning, and there is the, the, the runner-up in the provincial the Tory nomination, had written a letter to the uh, editor complaining about a biased report, and apparently he mentions in that report that that report was analyzed by the NDP and the Liberals, and he wanted to know why the Freedom Party candidate Charles Ovito was not involved. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> we have another uh, first time candidate here tonight who lives in Toronto and who will be running in the riding of Davenport. His name is Franz Kauke. Would you please welcome Franz? Franz Kauke. I was, uh, I was born in Windsor in 68 and raised in London. I made uh, first contact with Bob Metz here about 89 or, or 90 as a neighbor to their office at Richmond and King Street. Uh, I lived directly beside them, like right across the wall there. And so one day, spending hours figuring out all this employer health tax, CPP and UI because I was, had my own business, and frustrated how, as a first-time employer and only 19, 20 years old, how I was paying 10% of salaries uh, for the staff. To me, it just didn't make a lot of sense. So I think that's, uh, I saw the sandwich board on the street at the Freedom Party, and freedom, the word freedom just stuck in, so I walked downstairs. <laughs> and, uh, Bob, I'm not getting any freedom here in this, uh, in this city here. So... So I decided uh, at an early age that I wanted uh, more control of my own destiny. And uh, I've been self-employed ever since I was 19, actually, uh, after completing my uh, first year at Western in London. And I had a business there for a while. Uh, that's a commercial residential cleaning business. <clears throat> and then in 91, some people in this room might know dollars and cents. It's a coupon booklet. So I started that in 91, and during the mid-90s, I've lived in Kitchener, Waterloo, and Sarnia, uh, successfully expanding uh, dollars and cents. So we had about six different coupon books by the time I left there. 
And so in late 97, uh, basically I sold out and moved to Toronto, where I started uh, Fun Clips. Anyone might, you might have seen the car outside, all the graphics all over it. But uh, so basically I cover five different cities now, just uh, producing coupon books and so on. And my office is uh, in Davenport, which is how we've come up to decide to run in Davenport. And uh, basically, I'd like to say I'm proud to be here today in promoting fairness and personal freedoms for all people in Ontario and Canada. And uh, best of luck and Godspeed to all during the next election. Thank you.